Okay, so in this mini tutorial, I'm going to attempt to summarise what I see are the most important aspects of cochlear physiology. So I'm just trying to summarise what, what you've already had in the lecture. Um, and we're going to apply this knowledge um, to a, a clinical scenario that you might encounter, which is that of a cochlear implant. So first of all, let's just take a look at the cochlea um, in a little bit of detail. Uh, and what you need to remember is that um, physiologists represent the cochlea in a, um, a slightly unusual way. And what they do is they take the snail shell of the cochlea and they unravel it to produce something that looks like the image at the top left. So you can see that the central portion of this spiral is actually the bit at the end here. <coughs> And the open end of the snail shell, where the oval and the round windows are, is this end here. Okay, So this is the standard way that physiologists represent the cochlea. And this helps us to understand a number of aspects of its function. So what have we got in the cochlea? Well, the cochlea contains um, fluid. Okay, and It contains a number of membranes. The most important membrane is this one here depicted in green because this is where the important neuronal machinery resides which is responsible for transducing sound into neuronal impulses. So we're going to be focusing on this green membrane. Um, the, the yellow membrane, the, the Reisner's membrane, we're not going to focus on in much detail in this case. The next important thing you need to be aware of is the uh, stapes here, one of the um, inner ear bones, middle ear bones, sorry, and the stapes plugs into the oval window, okay, and the oval window interacts with the fluid sitting above this green membrane, whereas the round window sits lower down, and that interacts with the fluid below the um, membrane, okay. So when the stapes moves back and forth, i.e. following vibration of the eardrum and then transduction through the malleus and the incus, it causes the fluid here to move as well. So a sound wave is transduced into this fluid. Movement of this fluid causes movement of this membrane. Okay, And it's movement of the membrane that leads to transduction of sound waves into electrical impulses. So, how precisely does this transduction occur? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to zoom in um, on one portion of this membrane and look at it down here. Okay. So, um, specifically, the, the membrane that we're talking about, the green membrane, which, which is here, is called the basilar membrane. Okay. Um, and sitting on top of the basilar membrane is a number of what are called hair cells. So these are hair cells here, and they have little hairs, little cilia sticking out from the top of them, and these cilia are stuck to another structure called the tectorial membrane. Okay, So the tectorial membrane is like a little cap sitting on top of the cilia projecting from the hair cells. And what you've got to imagine is when the fluid above the basilar membrane vibrates, okay, when we've got vibration up and down in this fluid here, okay, it causes these hair cells to move a little bit laterally, okay, in this direction here that I'm showing. And this lateral movement of the hair cells results in movement of their cilia, okay, remember that the cilia are effectively tethered to the tectorial membrane, and this movement of the cilia causes changes in ion channels in the hair cells, leading to activation of the hair cells and impulses getting sent down through the cochlear nerve fibres. Okay, So, to my mind, um, that's about the detail that, 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 we, that I'm expecting you to know. Um, if, if you're interested, it's, quite, it's a slightly different arrangement to what we're used to seeing in neurons. Potassium has got a very important role in these hair cells, but we're not going to go into much more detail on that. So we've explained very briefly about how 
um, sound gets transduced into electrical impulses in the cochlea. Um, there's another thing that we need to realise, and that is that we've got hair cells all the way along the bacillar membrane like this. But the bacillar membrane is not uniform. If we measure the stiffness of the bacillar membrane, it changes as we move proximal to distal. Okay? And that has an absolutely vital role. Because what this means is that different frequencies are represented at different points along the bacillar membrane. Typically, low frequencies are represented much more distally. High frequencies are represented much more proximally. So we have what is known as a tonotopic representation. Okay, so you've, you're used to hearing about somatotopic representations, but in the cochlea we have a tonotopic representation, meaning that different frequencies are represented at physically different points in the cochlea. And this also goes further because when we look at the central nervous system nuclei which are responsible for processing sound and even at the auditory cortex, different frequencies occupy different parts of the brain. Okay, so you know, if we were to consider you know, a, a hypothetical um, nucleus which is processing sensory information from the cochlea, low frequencies would be represented at this part of the nucleus, high frequencies would be represented at the other part and everything, all the intermediates in between. So it's just like a somatotopic representation, but for sound instead. Now, we can, we can exploit this knowledge of the tonotopic map in the cochlea if we're trying to treat certain types of deafness. Now, what we have um, in a cochlear implant is we have um, a special receiving unit here, so I'll call this R, this is the receiving unit, and that is effectively um, a microphone. And this is detecting sounds across all frequencies. And the receiver is able to process those sounds, okay? And, and this processing splits up the sound into its different frequency components. Now, the receiver is connected effectively to a wire which is typically passed through the round window and goes into this compartment sitting beneath the bacillar membrane. And if you look at this wire very closely, you actually find that there are electrodes placed along the wire at given intervals. And these separate electrodes only switch on if a given frequency is represented in the sound that has been heard and processed by the receiver, okay? So you can imagine um, in a cochlear implant, if the person is exposed to very low frequency sounds, only these electrodes at this end are activated. If the person is exposed to very high frequency sounds, only these electrodes at this end of the wire are activated. So that's the basic principle for how a cochlear implant works. And I do recommend that um, if when you do um, your ENT jobs, you try to go and have a look at a cochlear implant being inserted because it's quite um, a precise and very delicate procedure. Okay, so that's all I'm going to talk about with respect to the cochlear.